Thank you. Good. I am so um, impressed with all of these people first thing in the morning. Uh, so um, that's a good thing and a bad thing, right? There's a reason why you guys are here. <laughs> and if everything was going swimmingly, you probably wouldn't be here. You'd be at home having your second cup of coffee. So um, thank you for coming. And if you have questions along the way, here's what I'd like to do. Because there's a lot of information that we can talk about, there will always be sort of directions we can go. Let's save the going off in different directions for the time we have for questions at the end. Uh, but if you have clarification questions along the way, please raise your hand and ask them. Because if there's something that is unclear to you, it's probably unclear <coughs> to other people too. So, executive functioning. Um, tell me what executive functioning is. Anybody want to? <coughs> yes. Time management. Time management's a good one. Any other thoughts? Yes. Organization. Organization, there's a good one too. Any other thoughts? Yes? Planning. Planning. Yeah. Those all sort of go together too, don't they? Time management, planning, and organization, they overlap a lot. So um, sometimes the best way to think about this is to think about <coughs> what kids look like without good executive skills. And we're going to talk about that. Um, we're going to talk about both a formal and an informal definition of executive skills. And um, here is the plan for the morning. We'll see how closely we can stick to this. We're going to talk about development of executive functioning um, and what you need to know in order to be able to think on your feet as you're trying to help your kids with organizational skills. We're going to talk about what happens when your child's development is out of sync with the executive demands in the world. And we're going to talk about then what you do about it. How do you create an environment where kids with weak executive skills are going to progress in their development and where you can support them. It's like we have more handouts yes. if anybody needs them. I'm just going to, this is the slides, just to pass them down, and this is the article. And almost all of the slides are in the packet. I think I, you know, did that thing of sticking in an extra slide or two after I sent these off. So, but mostly things are there. Okay. So, this is one of my favorite examples of kids with weak executive functioning or adults with weak executive functioning, right? <laughs> Um, and I'm here to tell you, by the way, that there is life on the other side of this. This, this was my son, so um, he's 28 now, and he actually seems to be turning into a fine, upstanding human being. <laughs> and so there, there's hope. I still have my fingers crossed because at 28, you're still not 100% certain, but it seems to be working more. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't know this was back, this was going in piece by piece, so let's get this all set up. No, it's just not going to give me the whole thing. Okay. Um, so the formal definition of um, executive functioning is not going to show up on the screen. Yes, it's going to happen. There we go. Okay, so um, the important thing to remember is that uh, the executive functions all have to do with supervising your own thinking and behavior. So kids who have weak executive skills have a hard time supervising their own work. If you feel like you're working overtime to be able to get your kid on track to make sure everything is done, that's because you are. A child who has weak executive skills is lacking in the ability to provide oversight for their own efforts. And um, these seem to arise, what we know right now, is there are uh, three different brain circuits that seem to be involved in this, and I'll spare you the details on that. There is a lot that's written about it if anybody is interested in getting into the details of that brain development. But we know that those three different brain circuits all overlap in the frontal lobes. And so we usually think of the frontal lobes as being the primary seat of uh, executive functions, but they are no, in no way the only place in the brain where we see them. 
When you're thinking about executive functions, we talk about them in terms of cool and hot functions. The hot is easy to remember because it's all about emotions and behavior. So uh, those executive functions apply both to thinking and to behavior. <coughs> and you have in your handouts, we won't go over it in a huge amount of detail um, because it's not important that you remember the list, but there are a set of executive functions <coughs> that we apply to those cool skills. There's a set that we apply to the hot skills, emotions and behavior. But what you need to know is, is different researchers and clinicians and authors will break those things down in different ways. Cool versus hot are clear, uh, have clear brain function and brain circuitry correlates. But then how you break it down specifically within those categories varies from one person to the other. Here is the list that we're using. Um, First of all, I have to apologize. I have a PC, and um, this is a Mac, and when you switch PowerPoint from a PC to a Mac, sometimes you lose things like alignment. <laughs> so, pardon that. That really bothers me, because I don't have executive function issues, and I hate when things are out of line. <laughs> so, okay. Cool skills, planning an organization. That one is sort of self-explanatory. Um, We'll talk about that a lot as we go. Working memory. Here's what you need to remember about working memory. Working memory is the ability to hold information in mind long enough to use it for a particular goal. Sometimes that's a short-term goal. Go upstairs, get your hat, your coat, your shoes, meet me down in the kitchen, right? And then 10 minutes later, you get this kid who's still sitting upstairs saying, now what was that you wanted me to get? Right? Or probably just picking fuzz balls off the rug, but hey. Um, <laughs> as kids get older, the demands shift, and instead what you have is, you know, you have three weeks to get this project done, here are the steps in the process, and um, how are you going to get there? <coughs> More importantly, can you remember what you were working on the day before? Or can you remember the ideas you had about where you were going to go with this paper? Those are all working memory issues. We used to think about um, working memory more as sort of a scratch pad function, just holding things on the scratch pad for a little while. But what we're understanding now as we have more advanced brain imaging techniques is that it's really a much more dynamic sort of thing. So it may be sitting in a classroom, the teacher says, remember we were talking about the Civil War and how the Civil War was different than, you know, the wars that came before it, and you're calling up that information, what do you already know about this, pulling it up onto your scratch pad, comparing it to incoming information, thinking about it, what information can you toss, what information you need to hold on to, and maybe holding that over to the next day. So it's a very dynamic sort of process. The ability to initiate. How many of you have kids who seem to have trouble getting started Yeah. This one drove me crazy. Now my kid actually does seem to have gotten sort of to the other side of that, which is, again, there's good news and bad news here. Um, the ability to start something is a neurological function that is a lot harder than stopping something. So our brains are wired in a way where it's easier to keep doing what we've already been doing than it is to stop and then start something else. So, um, you know, a lot of times what you'll hear from kids with weak uh, initiation ability is they'll say, no, I'm going to do it. Right, but it's due tomorrow. I know I said I was going to do it. You know, get off my case. Well, right, but it's 10 o'clock now and you're supposed to go to bed at 9.30. And, well, I said I was going to do it. Right? So. That initial, sometimes you need to really help with that, it's sort of like, you know, get the key turned, do it with them, get it started, we'll talk about some ideas, and if you have more questions about initiation, we can talk about that later. And then task monitoring. <coughs> the ability to uh, pay attention to what the goal is, 
to um, assess whether you're on track to meet the goal. Do you need to adjust your pace? Do you need to adjust your work style? Um, are you on track to hit the goal? Self-monitoring is just a little bit different. It has more to do with monitoring your own behavior, uh, looking around you. Do you seem to be uh, meeting the demands of the subtle social environment? Is your behavior in line with what teachers have asked you to do? Um, the ability to inhibit, which is just the ability to stop something. What's the flip side of inhibiting? Impulsiveness. Exactly, impulsiveness. So by definition, if you're impulsive, you have weak inhibition skills. Um, and just as an aside, for the subgroup of parents here who have kids with ADHD, um, what, uh, those of you who have kids who are on medication, what medication does is it bolsters that inhibitory mechanism. It doesn't necessarily hit all the other executive skills, but it's good on the inhibition path. Um, which in turn bolsters emotional control because a lot of that is about inhibiting, but it doesn't take care of the problem entirely because emotional control implies that you can bring thinking to bear on your emotions, which means you have to be able to step back and observe yourself. And then the ability to shift. So there are um, some kids, particularly those with attention disorders uh, without the hyperactivity, whose particular issue with attention is not paying attention, it's shifting attention. So they get locked onto a task like a dog with a bone, and then to get them, they have meltdowns when you try to get them to move to something. I wanted you to have this. We don't need to go over this. This is a, uh, a sort of table of executive function, and what you will see in kids who have trouble with executive functioning. Um, and so it's sort of a good model for thinking about your own uh, child and what the areas of weakness are because uh, executive functioning is, again, a, a comprised of several different circuitry and not circuits in the brain. And some people will have trouble with all of them, some with just some. And both the pattern and the intensity changes from one child to the next. So what you do will depend on where the specific weaknesses are. Um, what's important in thinking about this is to remember that there's a little bit of magic about executive functioning. So you have those tables of skills and you can break it down skill by skill, but there's something that's different about it when it's working well. When executive functions are just humming along, you hardly even notice the parts. And we talk about it like riding a bike. Someone who rides a bike well, it looks so easy, but when you think about the specific skills, when you break it down, you find that, oh, there are actually a lot of parts to this, and perhaps just as important, coordinating the various parts is really critical. So some kids have trouble with a particular part and some kids do fine until you get to the point where you have to put it all together, which is roughly about, what, middle school? That's when you start having to really put everything together, and that bumps up again in the beginning of high school. Um, but you can know how to pedal. You can sit on a, a, an indoor bike on a wind trainer and uh, pedal a bike. And you can practice the steering, because you can turn on a wind trainer. And you can get all the parts, but if you go outside and get on a bike, you're not going to be able to ride because it's the putting it all together where the magic happens, and the same is true of executive functioning. Typical development. Um, there are developmental surges. That's important because they affect the overall pattern. And what we know is that um, executive functions, rudimentary executive functioning starts really early in development, but there are particular places where you see um, real growth. And they tend to be about around the ages of like five or six is your first big surge. And then around middle childhood, which is like third, fourth grade, and then again around mid-adolescence, <coughs> mid to late adolescence. So as your kids are getting to mid to late high school, and that transition um, out of high school it is a, a package of skills where kids tend to start um, advancing. 
So the early efforts are those building those individual skills, pedaling, braking, steering. Uh, and then once you get into later development, it's both about coordinating and also about building better efficiency. So um, when things are going smoothly, <coughs> things work really well. Now we have some complicating factors. We won't get into it a huge amount, but you know the demands in the school systems, all schools, public and private, have changed dramatically over the years. Um, I don't know about you, but I remember kindergarten, first grade, mostly what we did was we went for walks and we collected leaves, right? <laughs> we ironed them between two pieces of wax paper. Yeah. And um, sometimes for an encore, we watched duck eggs hatch in an incubator, right? Now we take kids in preschool and sit them down on little desks and give them worksheets and tell them they're supposed to be able to do the alphabet, right? So really, I'm not sure that these demands work well for executive functioning. Even kids who can handle with content may not be able to handle the executive demands. So what we're seeing is a lot more kids that are falling out of the pack. Kids are, particularly who are really nice average development kids. And remember the word average has taken on negative connotations in our society. But what it means is that huge group of kids who are nicely under the bell in the bell curve, they're all average, and that's what most of the world is made up of, right? <coughs> so uh, it's a perfectly acceptable thing, um, and actually sort of a nice thing. So um, we know that kids who are delayed are going to be out of sync. We already know that there's more of a tendency for things to be out of sync because of the uh, advancement of these demands in the curriculum. And uh, when that happens, <coughs> you'll see delayed kids, but you're also going to see the gap widen at the point of those developmental surges. Because if you're delayed and the other kids are surging ahead at first, fourth, you know, twelfth grade, <coughs> and you are not, the gap will temporarily <coughs> widen until you catch up. Here's what happens. I just have to throw it in for fun. Here's what happens when you're out of sync. <laughs> so, um, funny, but it's, uh, yes. I'm sorry, but this is like a really perfect time to ask the question. Yeah. So for the child that is like that, and is not um, doing the work because he doesn't have the ability to use his skills to keep up, meaning he's not, not sure when to do the work because he doesn't have the skills. How, when he gets C, a couple C's, how do you act towards him? Like you act like, oh, that was good enough, or we're proud of you for that, or do you say, you need to work harder? Like how do you, oh, how it's do you not about it, but see, it's not about working harder if you don't have the skills, and we'll talk about that. It's never about working harder, because really, I just worked as hard as I could, and that's how I got this C. If I don't have the skills, working harder isn't going to help me, right? Mm -hmm. It's sort of like telling somebody who's never run before, just run faster, right? <laughs> so what you have to do in the same way is help them build up to that. So you have to know what they can do, and then you have to provide the support for what they can't do, give them a structure. And that is, that's what we're going to talk so then about. So that's specifically you applaud them for the same you, do You do neither. You, uh, depending on if you really think that's their best work, what you do is you talk about the content. Well, that's great. You knew that. Here's a piece you didn't seem to know. Or if it's in late, you can say, you know what? Wow, it's a shame that you didn't get this in sooner because you lost 10% on this. You would have done much better without it. Let's talk about how I can work with you to help you get it in sooner next time. Right? So it's an acknowledgement of the things they're truly having trouble with but you're trying to give them some support for the things they did know. Gosh, I know you knew this. It's a shame that you didn't study first, because I think you would have had it right on the tip of your tongue and then you would have been able to get better paid. Okay. okay, so, um, <coughs> there is a lot of normal variability in the development of executive functioning, just like there is in other areas of development. So sometimes, why is a kid having trouble? I don't know, he just hasn't gotten there yet. You know, it's not necessarily a diagnosable condition. 
We do know that there are some diagnosable conditions that um, are associated with weaker executive functioning. We know that kids with ADHD, we know kids with autism spectrum disorders, <coughs> and we know that kids with a certain number of medical disorders will have um, particular issues with executive functioning. We know that kids with learning disabilities tend to have a huge overlap with these kids with um, delayed executive functioning. So um, there are some diagnosable disorders, and those things tend to be more enduring, although there's uh, you know, a developmental disorder by definition, you're going to look different over time. And really, even these wildly hyperactive um, young kids will develop into much better skills with just a little input and direction over time. Um, but we also know that there are some temporary things that will affect executive functioning. We know that anxiety and depression will hit those executive functions, and that's really important because if you're really overwhelmed or stressed out, you're going to um, have you're going to be essentially um, um, secreting neurotransmitters that are going to cut off your access to the frontal lobes. That's what they're designed to do. That's what their whole that whole fight or flight thing is. So overstressed kids tend to have weaker um, ability to use the executive functions that they already have. And that's pretty easy to remember, because if you think about what happens if you are preoccupied, um, not that this has ever happened to me, but you walk out in the morning, and just as you're walking out, your husband says something to you like, I thought you were going to do this, you know? And you're like late, and you're on your way out. And so you say, don't have time to get into this. But you know you can't avoid getting into it in your head. You're already having the argument probably for most of the day, right? <laughs> so um, the things interfere. We know that physical health status is really important. Um, kids who are sick, um, kids who are uh, sleep deprived, kids who are not getting adequate nutrition. Uh, does this sound like your 11th grader yet? Uh, they all have trouble. So these things are really important. Improving health habits, sleep, nutrition, um, is not going to change that group of kids that has a diagnosable developmental disorder. It's not going to magically make the executive functioning weaknesses go away, but it will improve them. And there is a subset of kids who would not have problem if the rest of their lives were together. So keep that in mind. I don't want you to understand that as saying <coughs> that no kids should experience stress because we also know that there's sort of a U-shaped curve to uh, the effects of stress. So if someone says to you, you need to get this done and you have 12 weeks to do it, you're probably not experiencing a lot of stress until you get closer to the end of that 12 weeks, right? Um, and unless you're a very anxious person, in which case the second that it's assigned is the moment that the anxiety starts. But as you get closer and closer to that 12 <coughs> weeks out, you're going to have little bursts of adrenaline, and <coughs> adrenaline is what um, essentially smooths out the communication between the neurons in the brain and creates a, a sliding pathway. And so that's helpful to people. So again, there is an amount of stress that's helpful and helps you to get things done. That's all better. This is some of my favorite research. There's this elegant research um, that looked at what is the resource in our brains for executive functioning, and does it get used up? <laughs> And believe it or not, I love this stuff. Uh, I'm a real nerd with brain research. I love it. Yes, there is a specific resource that we can track. So actually, you can track glycogen storage. You know, glycogen is just stored glucose in the brain. And as glycogen diminishes, so does executive functioning. And furthermore, it is the same resource for hot and cool skills. So if you're working really hard to keep yourself in line behaviorally, you have less available for thinking. If you're working on a really hard project, you're going to have less available 
for control. Now we all know that to some extent, right? If you're working really hard, if your kids are working really hard on one thing, they tend to fall down in other areas, particularly those kids who have more limited resources. And some kids just seem to be born with limited resources. They don't store as much glycogen. And I think those are our, for instance, our ADHD kids who tend to just run out of speed more quickly, less available over time. How do you restore glycogen? One is by uh, actually glucose. I am really big on good nutrition, so this really bums me out. The research shows that a glass of sugary lemonade will help you function better. <laughs> um, I would say, you know, if your kid is working really hard, uh, maybe give them Gatorade instead of just lemonade because plain sugar is not so great for you in other ways, but it, it does help store. So snacks and a little bit of glucose are helpful for kids. Um, the other thing is that the time um, in certain situations will help restore that energy. Um, and interestingly enough, television time, which kids experience as being a rest break, does not do this. But what does do it is time out in nature. Music does it. Other sort, there, there are um, activities that are considered um, mid-level demands on your attention. So your brain is essentially free to wander while you are experiencing something positive. And really, television doesn't do that. Television demands your attention in certain ways. And even um, background attention to the level of you know, violence in cop shows and things like that seems to get brains off track. It raises the anxiety level even when people aren't aware of it. So anyway, I love that research better than I like the fact that I'm supposed to give my kids sugar. <laughs> yes? You said music is a nice break. Does music distract while the kids are trying to work? It does not seem to. Um, but mostly familiar music works well because your brain doesn't work hard to follow the patterns uh, as it does with unfamiliar music. You know how if it's something that you know that you've listened to a million times, your brain just slides right into that. So it's not commanding of attention. So it seems to work. And for emotional reasons anyway, I think particularly as kids hit teenage, they need a little bit of white noise because it seems to help them screen out all the other things that are distractors, you know, who said what to whom in the bathroom, those sorts of things. Okay. So that also means that um, if your child is having trouble with maintaining attention and you say to them, you're going to sit at this desk until you finish this assignment, what are you doing? You are ensuring that they're going to have more trouble. If on the other hand you say to them, you know what, you clearly need a little bit of a brain break. I want you to you know, take two laps around the house and then come back, or let's go for a little walk outside. Um, now, some kids will tolerate that, but really some of your kids are past that. Like, really, a walk? <laughs> um, but if you can get them to take a break. Now, here's the definition of a break. A break is something that lasts a short amount of time, and then you have a planned time to return a break is not something that has no end point. It's very important that you teach your kids that. It's time to take a break. How much time do you think you need? I don't know. I'll come back to it when I'm ready. <laughs> no, that's not the definition of a break. OK. So we know the kids who need support, there are two categories, right? There are the kids who are delayed in a specific skill. And there are the ones that are having trouble putting it all together when it gets to be time to pull things together. That's why we have that jump in uh, problems at the beginning of middle school and usually um, at the beginning to mid high school things shift dramatically too. Because at some point, the issue is juggling multiple demands. And if you're having trouble juggling multiple demands, you're going to start having a lot of trouble. And it's really important because as an adult, what are you doing most of your day? You are figuring out you know, what you need to be attending to right now 
and somehow you're accounting for the things that are going to be need, need to be done later or maybe tomorrow, right? And you've got to account for those well enough to get them off of your radar screen, but not so far off your radar screen that you don't remember to do them until someone is standing over you saying this was due two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> if you're feeling this way at this point, I bet. <laughs> yes? Will they outgrow it, or do some kids outgrow it? Ah, such a good I mean, question. Like college, what happens to college? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about, it's in here, but let's talk about that now. Okay, so development, here's what we know. We know that um, development of the executive functions um, is is not complete until very late in life. It is the last system to come fully online. Um, and uh, the way I like to think of it is that there is good news and bad news. The good news is that most of your kids are not anywhere near the point where full development is expected. Um, most researchers think that full development is probably not until your fourth decade of life. Um, However, um, generally we see most of the development by around the age of 25, okay? Early 20s, and that's relatively new. The last decade or two, we've discovered that kids are still developing. There is some great research, some of it written in a very light tone um, by J. Gied, G-I-E-D. <coughs> he was the first person to uh, take his research subjects at NIMH and follow them beyond high school. And he discovered great development at that point. So most kids have done the bulk of their development, though, by about the age of 18. That corresponds with that leap to college where you become more independent. So what happens if your kid is delayed? All I can tell you is we see a lot of kids first, end of first semester of college, Christmas break, they have by that point either made it to probation or flunked out. <clears throat> Some kids can flunk out with remarkable speed even though they have done well in high school. <laughs> Again, not that I have ever have a child that would do that, but um, I'm here to tell you it happens sometimes. And um, it has to do with the level of independence that's required. I mean, if you think, think about what you did in college, it's amazing any of us survived anyway, right? So um, if you have a kid who doesn't plan well, doesn't organize well, doesn't prioritize well, um, it's a little scary to think about. Um, when you're on the other side and you're on the parent's side, it's scary to think about. Right? Um, most of the kids, though, remember, <coughs> if they're young, you're still going to see a lot more development. Now, um, the girls, as usual, seem to develop more quickly. Um, there are some that are still going to be way out of whack and more in that range where the boys are. But for the boys, my personal experience with kids I've worked with and kids I've raised has been that that amount of time between about, oh, 22 and 26 years of age seems to be another little sprinkling of magic fairy dust, <laughs> fortunately. Um, so you have a lot of time, depending on how delayed your child is, that may or may not even be an issue, because really some of your kids are going to even out before they get to that point. Um, as with any other characteristic where there's developmental implications, there's a whole range of problems. Some are relatively mild. They're a year or two behind. They're going to catch up. They're going to be fine. Maybe they'll need a little extra support or a little extra kick, you know, early on in college. Um, but then they're going to do fine. And then there are kids at the other end of the spectrum <clears throat> who are just, you know, so far behind. They are not going to make it there. They're going to need an alternate path in life. That's a very small percentage. I would say say probably maybe one to two percent of the kids with executive functioning problems, not of the general population, but of the kids with executive functioning problems. Okay. Okay, this just doesn't want to move off there. Right, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, so there we go. Let's talk about some of the things that we do. Um, if 
you have weak executive functions, particularly if, if you have trouble with planning and organizing, here's what happens. You are lacking the internal skeleton that we use to hang things on, okay? So I don't know about you, but I have you know, many different areas that I have to put my time and attention to every day. When I wake up in the morning and get started, right, as I'm launching myself out of the cannon, I'm thinking to myself, okay, what are the things that I must get done today? What's on the schedule? Usually the night before, I look at my schedule for the next day because I've got to orient myself, right? I don't want it, anything to be a surprise. And so I sort of have things planned out. These kids don't until they arrive at wherever, the place they have not thought about what they need. Like, how do you walk out of the house with a backpack without thinking about what needs to be in there? Right? Well, that's what these kids do all the time. I don't know, the backpack was there, I picked it up, and I walked out. Right? Finished your homework? Did you think about where you should put that homework? No, it's, you know, I think it's in there somewhere, right? So, um, there, what you're doing is two things. First of all, you're providing a structure that will help them to manage the task. Secondly, what you have to do is provide a model for them so that when their brain is ready for it, they have the model in their head because remember, they're delayed. While those models are being taught in school, sometimes just by example, sometimes by specific structure, um, your kids are not ready to pick them up. So you've got to keep that model in front of them for longer. So, um, you know, most of these kids are doing fine when they have to have, you know, the yellow folder every time they walk in the classroom and the teacher sets it up for them and their moms check it at home every night. But then once you get rid of that glossy yellow folder, that's when they start falling apart. So the other thing that we know is that once something becomes a habit, it no longer lives in the part of the brain responsible for executive functioning. So the more you can build habits and routines, the more your child is going to be able to function. The modeling of the structure is for when they're functioning on their own. Otherwise, it would be okay to just follow them around the house and say, do this, do this, do that, right? But that's time limited, and as soon as you're out of the picture, it's not going to work. So we're always trying to get kids to step back and develop a model for how you handle something and try to organize that into a routine. Okay, so here are some examples of the kinds of routines that we need, right? Beginning of the day, end of the day. Um, when do you do homework? You know, how do you fit your sports practice in? When do you fit in planning for the next day? And how do you work in getting enough sleep? You know, what is your final line on bedtime? When do you make exceptions for that? Those are all routines. If something is going to be different, you need to have a way to uh, shift that. Which, so, you know, it's a good thing to consider with your child at the beginning of the week if something different is coming up. Wednesday, we have to, you know, drive into Northern Virginia for Grandma's birthday dinner. So, you're not going to have time to do X, Y, and Z. When are you going to do that? Right? Um, planners and calendars are critical, and we're going to talk a lot more about those. And this time to pause and reflect. How many of you have kids who have schedules where they have time to pause? Great, I love it. Just a few of you. How many of you have time in your own day to pause and reflect? Cool. That's critical time that in neurological language that's called consolidating memory traces. Right? Um, we know that there are certain things that work, and I am far from, you know, a, someone who can model this perfectly, but we know that there are um, huge benefits, even for the executive functions, from meditation. Um, I wish I could tell you that I was a good model for that, but I'm not, but I know people who do meditate every day who have found great improvement in their functioning. Um, we do know that kids just need time to 
to calm down and to de-stress. And a lot of our kids are going, going, going right up to the last minute. So think about that um, extra time. We always recommend in classrooms whenever we're consulting directly that the last few minutes of a class be a time that are slight overview of what we talked about today, preview of the next day, and do you have everything you need to move on to your next class? Do you know what you need tonight? All of those things are just moments to pause and reflect, and I think those are really important. Any questions up to this point about anything that we talked about? Um, Let's talk about how you focus on executive functioning. Um, <coughs> the question about um, the child gets a C, right? Not because they can't do the content, but because they haven't done all of the other things. Um, so you have to identify what are those other things that they should have done, and focus on those, not focus on them in the sense of why didn't you do this, <coughs> to focus on them in the sense of what do you need to know in order to be able to do this better. Um, if kids are clueless, then you know that you need to be involved or someone else needs to be involved in helping them figure those things out. And then those become the deliberate focus of what you're doing with them. So um, you need to allot time for that. These are not kids who are going to be able to get their homework done well on the fly. They need time to have you help them plan and organize, if you still can. And as your kids age, it's going to be a lot harder for you to be the one to do it with them. Um, if you have a specific focus on executive functioning, so that means that you also have to treat it as something to come back to and <coughs> give them the overview on how they're doing. Gee, I noticed you started that a lot sooner than, we, um, than before. Um, that, that was my friendly time reminder. You can just wave your hand and go with me. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Um, we are going to stop at 9.15 and then questions till 9.30. Is that what our demand is? OK. Um, so um, when you focus deliberately, you have to then come back to it. If you have told a kid, I can't believe you waited until Monday to start this project, and you've known about it for three weeks, and now you're going to be terrible on it, and what did you expect, and you know, what have you been doing, and haven't I been telling you you need to get this and that, then the next time, if they start earlier, and they still get a lousy grade because they didn't get it done, what do you think they're supposed <coughs> to say? Well, let's say this. If you say to them, you did it again, right? <coughs> then you have not encouraged whatever positive development they've made. So what you want to say is, gee, it's a shame that you got a lousy grade. And it wasn't quite done. And you know, the teacher may not appreciate this. But I want you to know that I appreciate that you started this a lot sooner. Cool. That's the right direction. Of course, the teacher won't be able to appreciate it until you get it to the point where it's actually done on the day it's due. So let's keep working on that, buddy. What do we need to do differently next time? Okay. Um, repetition helps build routines and habits. So we want to re repeat things over and over and expect that the first time they're not going to get it. And we know that you want to have a coaching mindset, not a policing mindset. Okay? So we're trying to encourage skills. We're not just at the end of the whole thing going to say you either you know did wrong or you did right. Um, let's take uh, a quick look at this slide, and then let's um, then we'll look at how you put it into action in a plan. Okay. So what we're always trying to do for these kids who have new <coughs> planning skills is to make planning the first step. If you have a three-week assignment, then the first night it's assigned, your job should be planning. And if you have done the planning well, you are done for the day. That's it. That's great work on the project. You're done. Um, you know that you need to keep the due dates visible. Um, if they can't see the due date, it's gone. It's out of their head. It doesn't exist, um, which means we have to break projects down into smaller chunks. 
where you may help them learn to map it onto a calendar, which helps us then to focus on when they're going to do the work, not when the work is due. Okay? Very, two very different things. The more challenging the content, so something that's new or really hard, the more trouble a kid is going to have with the project if they also have trouble with planning and organizing. So anytime new content is involved, we want the, the executive load to be low. We want it to be done in a pattern or on a type of project that they've already done before. So you don't do the first long-term assignment um, with really hard content because the process is to learn how to do a long-term assignment. Right? If, on the other hand, you have now been doing long-term assignments um, for a little while and you've got that procedure down, or you've been doing labs for a while now, then we can start introducing hard content. Okay, planners are critical. Um, I, you know, your kids are, most of you have kids that are already a little older, but I start <coughs> with kids very young. None of them get away without using planners, even when they're at the point where they can remember everything. Um, it's a little harder to introduce later, but it's, it's still critical. So if your child is not actually using a planner well, that's something you need to uh, get involved with and teach them to do. So first of all, what day of the week is this, do you think, looking at this planner? What day? Yes. It's e well, it's either Tuesday or Wednesday, right? We don't know whether they finished the one day and started the next or not. So it's Tuesday or Wednesday, and here's what you'll notice on there. Um, there is a, something in every square. If you don't have homework, it says no homework. It's not just that I forgot to write it down. There is no homework that day. If it's something that you were supposed to do, you've got it checked off already, right? Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, right? Those are days that have something else happening. That's down at the bottom. So you need to remember when you're planning. That's Grandma's birthday. Um, we'll talk about Thursday notes. And on Thursday, you'll notice that there's something written sideways. On Friday, there's something written sideways. Anytime that you have a due date that's not tomorrow, then you write the what's due sideways in the planner box. Anytime you have something written sideways in a planner box, that means that you still you have work to do to plan it out. Okay? And when you plan it out, you have to have a list of what are the subtasks involved in getting that done. And then you have to put them on your schedule for the day you're going to do them. That's the planning piece that I talked about. So if you have a three-week assignment, you should still have that written sideways, but you will have individual tasks, and you will know exactly when you need to do them. Anybody who's ever done any project management knows that that's essentially what you're doing, and that's what we need to teach kids to do, because tests and projects <coughs> don't exist in kids' heads as homework. It's just, do you have any homework? No. Right? I did it all in school. What about that test? Oh, yeah, that's not till next week. Yes? Do they have classes that you can institute in the curriculum that help get the kids on this? Proven pattern? Um, well, here's the thing about specific classes. It has to be done, uh, this stuff has to be done on a regular basis. You can teach a kid to set up their notebook this way, but somebody has to be looking over their shoulder on a regular basis. Would it be good to be part of the educational curriculum? I mean, is it for you know all what I would like? For the whole universe? Absolutely. Students? I think it would be a lovely thing. I think you get that on the page, and then you have a study hall every day for those kids who need it, right? And the purpose of that study hall is kids are working on their actual work, and there's somebody there monitoring who comes around and says, what are you working on? That's funny, I don't see it in your planner. What else do you have to do? Yeah, it seems to me they should institute this daily in the curriculum for all the students. I am like an outside person, so. <laughs> <laughs> that is part of what the learning specialists have done help kids with this when they need help. See, you guys are all here. It just doesn't help kids with, you know, those problems. It could help the whole universe of kids. Yes. <coughs> yes. Particularly as we're demanding more 
earlier of kids. Remember, even those kids who have pretty normal average development are falling out of the pack now, so they need extra skills. We can either shift the curriculum again, which I don't think you and I are going to you know, be involved with kids in the school system by the time that pendulum swings back, um, if it ever does. But um, the alternative is to, to give the kids more tools earlier. Lovely idea. <laughs> Here's, here's the issue. I mean, that's great for maybe first, second grade, but by the time you get into third grade, I mean, my kids are in fifth grade and seventh grade. They're not writing anything down. They have to incorporate iCal or Google or something because oh, there are go on. This so many activities in, in a trusted one source, and that seems to be the problem because they have Edmodo, that classrooms, and they don't have one calendar. Like I'm teaching my kids everything on iCal, trusted source, that's where it is. Everything goes on that calendar in different categories. That is colors. that absolutely. It is best when the school um, has, for instance, one format that they use. Every teacher is required to use the same format. But then you're gonna have different sports schedules. It is always there always has to be a repository for all of the information. Right, like the, yes. the cloud. Yes. Or whatever. Or but the cloud, goes but on that. exactly. Yes. And this works very well, for instance, on iPads or iPhones. Not a problem. Works well on PCs. I mean, I'm, I'm not a Mac person. I use Google, you know, and I have a Google Calendar, and it has everything. Uh, you know, I can, and I import whatever. That is what you need to teach them now is to have a central calendar. Um, other questions about that? But the other thing is, by the way, your kids are not going to do this willingly because they love to do it. <laughs> you know, but as far as what I do with kids who are disorganized, I, I don't have a lot of hard lines. This is one of them. This is a hard line. If you come home and you don't have the information you need, I'm really sorry, that's too bad, but, you know, you've lost your electronic privileges for the day. But I couldn't help it. I didn't say you could help it, I'm just really sorry, um, but, you know, let's talk about what you can do differently tomorrow. But I lost my, oh, gosh, what a shame, because until you find your no electronic privileges, or if you'd rather replace it, you have the money to do that, that's fine. That's okay. Whatever. It is a hard line. And again, I don't have a lot of hard lines, but that's one of them. Kids need to learn to do this. Particularly the disorganized kids who will always go back to their default mode, which is, I'll figure it out along the way. Right? And so you have to be, and remember, if their self-monitoring skills are delayed, then they're not going to see how it's going to affect them, nor are they seeing how far off the general trend they are. So you have to be the one that does that. And that's just one of those parent things that's not fun and it wears you out, but it's, you know, there's that and you're not allowed to run around by yourself after dark when you're three, you know? I mean, you just can't, that's all. Okay. Um, again, uh, Thursday notes. Here's what Thursday notes are. Thursday notes are for your kids who have significant problems with executive functioning, who often are missing papers, grades, the ones who have straight A's except for the zeros because they didn't know they had that assignment. So Thursday notes are a regular template that you keep in your computer, and that reads something like this. Dear Teacher X, I just want to make sure that we are in agreement that I have turned in everything that was due up to today and that I have all of my long-term assignments recorded. As far as I know, I have a test next week but nothing else due, or whatever that is. And that gives the child time to get an email back and collect things to do over the weekend if they're missing anything which sort of helps with the problem of work getting you know, lost, delayed, and building up to the point where it feels impossible to catch up. Okay? 
Furthermore, if for a significant portion of your life you're going to be a person who has trouble monitoring what's due when, you had better figure out some techniques for how you're going to have somebody else help you keep track of it. And I'm here to tell you that teachers love it if you actually say, I know I have this problem, would you help me with it? The thing they can't stand is when you say, I'm fine, right? Leave me alone. But the ability to ask for help is also involved with the executive functions because you have to be able to self-monitor. So again, you need to have a template. If it comes up regularly, then you need to help your child develop a tool for managing that and a technique, okay? So that's what we do with third say notes. Um, organizers, if your child has trouble planning and organizing, there are a variety of different forms of organizing <coughs> software you can use. Um, in your handout, you have this, and it gives you the names of a few programs. There are many more, and folks here at the school are pretty good on organizing software. Um, you can teach them using schoolwork. You can teach them using non-school activities, too. The non-school activities tend to be more interesting to kids, so it's a good way to teach, teach them to use software. Okay? Um, deficits in executive functioning are treated as delays and deficits, not as um, behavioral lapses, so that you um, see it as something that you're really working on with your child. <coughs> and um, kids, whether they're disorganized or not, uh, tend to do best in places where it is safe to fail sometimes. And by fail, I don't mean you know getting zeros in, getting E's necessarily. What I mean is that everything screws up sometimes, and home is supposed to be a place where people will tell you directly when you've screwed up, but then will help you figure out what you did wrong and how to do it differently next time. Um, they tend to do best in settings where the feedback is unbalanced, more positive than negatives. And the trouble uh, with uh, providing honest and true positive feedback to your kids, because all you're seeing is the negative stuff, here's a simple trick. Take two paper clips, put them in one pocket. By the time you go to sleep that night, you have to transfer all the paper clips to the other side, to another pocket. And the only way you can transfer is by each paper clip you transfer when you say something honest and true that is positive to your child. Okay? Got to be real. It's not, oh, you're such a great kid. It's got to be something spe specific and real. And I challenge you to show me any kid going through a whole day that hasn't done some positive things during their day. They can be small. Thank you for coming in and not slamming the door behind you. If in fact slamming the door is something they've had trouble with. Right? Thanks for not bumping your brother on the head as you walk by. Okay. Most of our students are smart enough to recognize when they're screwing up. They're just not skilled enough to be able to figure out what they need to do and to help themselves. So that's our job, and that's the job of learning specialists. Um, this is in there. We're going to skip this so that we have time for a couple of questions. It's all in there.